So I'm going to make a start um, and I have a bit of a wander through some rescue strategies for uh, hypoxia. Okay. So what we're going to do in the uh, brief presentation is to revise some of the physiology of APRV and how that works, um, indications and contraindications, and also to talk to uh, the physiology of prone positioning for ventilation. Uh, and again, indications, contraindications, uh, how it works, why it works, and some of the evidence behind it. Okay. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what refractory hypoxemia is. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to mention this is that there are various different definitions that we use to talk about hypoxia. Uh, and also there's some controversy about actually what, uh, what, optimal, what optimal oxygenation is. Um, and that's some of the issues when we look at studies of uh, oxygenation. So a sort of conventional definition of refractory hypoxemia would be you've exhausted all conventional ventilation. Um, so you're meeting uh, you're using high pressure ventilation, and in doing that, uh, you're giving a, an FI2 of one. Uh, and despite all of those things, you're still not achieving uh, what would be considered acceptable oxygenation. Uh, and when we talk about acceptable oxygenation, we perhaps talk about PO2 of greater than eight, um, or we talk about SATs of uh, greater than 94%. But those definitions do change a little bit, um, and they change a little bit. Uh, in, in different pa patient populations as well. Why is hypoxia important? Well, hypoxia is important because ultimately um, that determines the oxygen uh, that is present at the tissue level to allow all of your tissues to, uh, to, to respire and to be metabolically active. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you haven't got enough oxygen to supply those tissues, then those tissues become ischemic uh, and die uh, and cause organ dysfunction. So oxygen is required to prevent all of those things. Um, and we know that uh, ventilating using very high pressures or certain modes of ventilation can be harmful. So all the time, we've got a bit of a tension between getting enough oxygen to our tissues uh, and not doing harm because of the ventilation that we're, uh, we're, we're using on our patients. So there's all the time this balance and, and lots of moving parts to trying to work out what the optimal oxygen, oxygenation is, what the optimal mode of ventilation is, um, and how how we individualize that for our individual patients. So firstly, oxygenation targets. Um, increasingly over, uh, over the last few years, there's, there's been interest in, uh, in looking at what the optimal targets might be in different patient populations. And as ever in intensive care, we perhaps do a, uh, or we see a small study that happens in general medicine, uh, and then we do that study on a small, population intensive care, then we broaden it out to uh, a larger intensive care population and we find that a particular intervention has no difference um, because of the heterogeneity of, of uh, critically ill patients. Uh, and that's one of the problems with lots of research in uh, intensive care. So on the slide there, there's um, some of the recent trials and recent studies that have been looking at oxygenation. Uh, so for example, um, the, uh, the HOT ICU trial which looked at uh, different targets, sort of con conservative 88 to 92 versus conventional um, uh, greater than 94 uh, target for oxygenation. There is reasonable evidence in uh, specific patient subgroups, um, such as post cardiac, uh, post uh, MI, that uh, using too, too high a, a saturation target can be harmful. So, for example, the AVOID trial in ST elevation and myocardial infarction. We're currently involved in the UK ROX trial at the, um, uh, the Royal, which is, again, the biggest study in a heterogeneous uh, general mixed intensive care population to compare uh, conservative sets of 88 to 92 to usual, uh, usual care. And the usual care is defined as uh, what the treating clinician feels is appropriate. Uh, and that's the sort of the UK wide big study to look at actually do conservative uh, oxygen targets make a difference in the general ICU population um, in, in, in the UK. Uh, and that's looking at the ventilator days uh, and looking at mortality as, a, uh, as an endpoint. And there's a load of other things built into that study as well, um, looking at SF60s and psychological questionnaires further down the line. Uh, 
So in terms of defining uh, hypoxia and refractory hypoxia and optimal oxygenation targets, jury's out and we don't really know what's optimal for our patients. So that's one, one problem when we look at what we should be actually trying to achieve. But a conventional wisdom would say we're looking at a P, uh, PO2 of greater than 8 um, or SATs of greater than 94 to 98 in the usual population. So coming back to talking about refractory hypoxia, I said hy refractory hypoxia was where you've maxed out on conventional ventilation. So we need to talk a little bit about what conventional ventilation is. Um, and a lot of the, the, the perceived wisdom uh, around conventional ventilation came from the ARDSNET trial. Uh, so the ARDSNET trial was a comparison of lower tidal volume ventilation versus traditional tidal volume ventilation. Uh, uh, it was in year 2000. Um, and at that time, conventional ventilation was considered 10 to 12 mils per kilogram um, of tidal volume. That's absolutely huge volumes um, compared to what we do now. Um, and, uh, and this study did show um, a difference in terms of mortality in patients receiving a lower volume ventilation. Uh, and that really paved the way to say, well, actually, our standard, our gold standard of conventional ventilation should be that we're, um, we're using the lower type volumes, we're using a maximal pressure um, of, uh, of 30 centimetres of water in, in, in our conventional ventilation. ARDSNET was a, uh, based on a specific patient population, so it was uh, a patient population based around acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, and those were patients that met the, uh, the, the LIN criteria for the diagnosis of ARDS. So um, those were patients with respiratory failure that wasn't due to, uh, due to cardiac failure, they had four quadrant infiltrates on the x-ray at a PF ratio of less than 300 millimetres of mercury. Um, and this wasn't something that was purely due to, cardio, uh, due to cardiac reasons. Um, I put on the slide um, some work from a paper that's just come out looking at the new changing definition of ARDS, and that's probably come about because we're using a lot more high-flow nasal oxygen these days. Uh, and so high-flow nasal oxygen has entered into the new global definition of ARDS in that um, you've got this respiratory failure um, despite patients being on hypermixed oxygen, so they don't necessarily need to be intubated. Um, so the definition has changed and that's, that's quite new. So revisiting what we've talked about so far, refractory hypoxemia is patients that are hypoxic despite um, using lung protective ventilation and the background of that being from the ARDSNET trial in the year 2000. And the ARDSNET trial being the, the sort of gold standard trial of the time um, has entered into um, guidance for how we should be managing um, severe respiratory failure. Uh, and on, on the slide for uh, those who are interested, I've got the faculty of intensive care medicine guidance uh, for the management of uh, ARDS, respiratory distress syndrome. And again, from the ARDSNET trial, we're using low tidal volumes. Uh, so a tidal volume of less than six mils per kilogram of ideal body weight, not total body weight, uh, and a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimetres of water. If we've done that and we're still on 100% you know, oxygen, we're still not achieving our oxygen targets for that patient, we're into the territory of looking at what else we can do, because if we go beyond that, we're probably going to be doing harm for that patient. So that's when we try and reach into our toolbox and see what we've got as a rescue strategy for hypoxemia. Well, the rest of that slide's got a few other bits and bobs that we uh, we also sometimes use. So prone positioning, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, high frequency oscillatory ventilation, which uh, I certainly encountered a little bit earlier on in my training. I suspect if you're uh, in training now, you've probably never seen or never had any involvement in. And a few other things that we do. So conservative fluid management, drying a patient out, which um, I know certainly before I want to refer anyone for ECMO, we'd normally try and maximise uh, diuresis in those patients. Using a high peep strategy is something that we do um, frequently and using uh, strategies that um, opt to increase recruitment. So for example, APRV, which we're going to talk about a bit later on. Neuromuscular blocking agents, not going to talk about that in a great deal. Um, and but that is something that we sometimes do if the patient um, is unable to tolerate ventilation and we're struggling to achieve adequate ventilation. Uh, and then we've got ECMO, uh, which I'm not going to talk about because that's not within my scope of practice. 
and then there's a few other things which um, there isn't really any evidence for. So um, inhaled nitric oxide um, steroids is a subject of uh, current research um, and ECOR. So we were involved for a short while at the Royal in the uh, REST trial using extracorporeal CO2 uh, removal, which again is a strategy that you try and reduce your um, the damage caused by your ventilation um, by using some other way of achieving gas exchange. So in, in this case, using an external device to remove CO2 and then not using such high pressures or such uh, damaging settings on the ventilator. And that's a subject of current research, for example, the rest trial, which, is, uh, which I think is still ongoing. As I said, the elephant in the room is ECMO because I'm not going to talk about that. OK, um, so this isn't the lung, but this is a sort of schematic that gives you an idea of what the lung is like. So the lung is a bit like a sponge, uh, and it has lots of bubbles all over it. And those bubbles have uh, a degree of surface tension, which means that they all sort of will collapse at different rates, different time constants. And when you ventilate a patient, you uh, put sequentially high pressure and then low pressure through those units. And you can imagine that if you've got a very large bubble, um, if you put a high pressure through that, you are you're going to potentially over distend that, and you might over distend that before you over distend one of your small bubbles. So that's one problem. So if you're if you're putting high pressure through the lung, you can end up with over distension, and that's an issue. If you've got a degree of lung damage and you've got some narrowing of your bronchial tree during the expiratory phase you may end up with, uh, with narrowing of the airways and you might not be able to expire completely. And that can, can, can cause gas trapping and that can cause the bubbles to become larger. Uh, and you can have, you can then end up with high intrathoracic pressures and further difficulty ventilating. Similarly, if you're uh, sequentially going between high pressure and low pressure, you can end up with your alveoli opening and then collapsing. And all of those things can cause various different types of trauma. So we've got barotrauma, which is the trauma caused by, um, by virtue of uh, having high pressure. You've got volume trauma. That's where you over distend your lung units uh, and you're putting through too much volume through them. And you've also got other forms of trauma as well. So you've got atelect trauma, uh, which is the trauma caused by the shearing forces of opening and closing those lung units all the time. And then you've got biotrauma as well, which is the trauma caused purely by um, circumventing the um, circumventing the protective mechanisms of the respiratory tract. So you've got your biofilm uh, and you're causing damage by virtue of that. So ventilation is dangerous, ventilation is harmful, and we try and apply the principles of lung protective ventilation to try and avoid those, uh, avoid those problems. And if you think back when you've got a patient that you're struggling to ventilate, what you do? Well, you perhaps put up the pressure, you possibly put up the respiratory rate, and both of those things probably do harm in the way that I've said. So you're increasing the opening and closing of lung units. You're probably increasing over distension of the lung and you're causing an increase in gas trapping. So you enter a, uh, a cycle of ventilatory failure. So higher pressure leads to over distension, leads to more gas trapping, which causes an increase in intrathoracic pressure and then causes things to spiral uh, and keep moving around the circle. High pressure in your ventilation not only affects the respiratory system because you've got another big organ in there as well, it affects your cardiovascular system. And um, when you increase your intrathoracic pressure, you're going to impair things return to the heart. So you can cause significant cardiovascular collapse. And for those of you um, who have perhaps been involved in the care of asthmatic patients who end up being uh, ventilated, they can have really profound respiratory collapse um, when they go on to, uh, onto a ventilator. And that's partly because of the increased thoracic pressure. It's also partly because they're very dry because they've lost a lot of fluid and they're inadequately resuscitated. But the high pressures, the gas trapping um, and the over distension caused by conventional uh, ventilation can be really harmful. So we seek to minimize that by using lung protective strategies. Um, and when we're not able to do that, we start reaching for things like rescue strategies and rescue, uh, rescue mechanisms. Um, 
The other thing that I've put on the slide and mentioned is um, patient, uh, patient related or patient induced lung injury, um, which is sometimes where you've got a patient breathing over the top of, uh, on top of a ventilatory mode. Um, and the significance of that isn't entirely clear, but you can imagine if someone's coughing or breathing on the top of a mode of ventilation, you can then have very high spikes in your pressure, um, which can be harmful and cause damage to the lung tissue as well. So all of these things, um, can contribute to um, ventilator-induced lung injury or villi. So the game of ventilation really is to try and avoid uh, avoid doing damage and maximise the beneficial effects. So the two things are the two mechanisms I was going to talk about today were, were prone ventilation and APRV. So thinking about the lung when we've got our patient with ARDS, the lung you can think about as a as a wet sponge. So you saw from the picture earlier, it's, it's got lots of different lung units, um, alveol alveolar units of different sizes and in different states of over distension. Um, in ARDS, you also have the issue of capillary leak. So the lungs are really wet and really boggy. And if you think about the supine patient, the weight of that lung is pushing down. Um, so that's causing atelectasis and collapse, collapse of the uh, dorsal lung units which means um, that they aren't ventilated effectively. They might be diffused. They probably will be diffused because they're, um, because they're dependent, but they probably won't be ventilated. So as you see on the, um, uh, on the left side of the picture, the, the slightly darker blue shows areas that are ventilated, and the lighter blue to white shows areas that aren't necessarily particularly well ventilated. So the anterior part of the lung probably is better ventilated, whereas the posterior isn't so well. The, um, the micrograph on the bottom shows, uh, shows how, uh, how that appears uh, so in vivo. So that's a CT scan of a patient with ARPS, showing that you've got all of this sort of honeycombing at the base of the lung, or at the dorsal part of the lung, rather. So that lung probably isn't effectively vent uh, ventilated. So you have a degree of VQ, mix VQ mismatching. So on the right hand side, you can see what happens when we turn that patient prone. So this um, is a patient who is the other way up. Um, and what does that mean? Well, that means that the larger posterior segments of the lung aren't dependent anymore. So that allows them to open up, that allows them to drain somewhat, and that allows them to be ventilated. So your lungs aren't symmetrical in shape. You've got far more lung volume that goes posteriorly and goes down behind your uh, goes down uh, the back. And so if you can utilize that by turning the patient prone, that means that you're improving your VQ matching. You're now ventilating all of that area that wasn't particularly well ventilated before. Um, and you are hopefully ventilating that patient better. The other thing you're improving, so I've not put the heart on this diagram, the heart's obviously quite um, anterior. So if that heart now becomes um, uh, into the, in the posterior position, you put it in prone, then that heart's not pressing on the lung tissue. Um, so you've got, again, less collapse, less atelectasis, you've got more recruitment. Um, and that means that hopefully you're improving your VQ matching in that simple manoeuvre. There are some other um, effects as well. So you're not just turning that wet sponge upside down um, and improving the oxygenation, you're doing a few other things. So on the diagram here, you can see um, the side view of what happens when you turn a patient, uh, turn a patient prone. So you're, you reduce the abdominal pressure, so that reduces the pressure pushing up on the diaphragm to some degree, provided you've done your prone positioning effectively. Um, so in terms of prone positioning, we try and take the pressure off the abdomen. So we normally have um, supports over the chest, supports over the pelvis, and the abdomen free to move. So that should improve your FRC, your functional residual capacity. Um, you should inflate the lung at a slightly lower pressure. So rather than using that really high damaging over 30 centimetres of water pressure, you might be able to come down a little bit with pressures. You should have less abdominal compression as well because you've deliberately taken the pressure off that. The dorsal chest wall isn't particularly compliant. Um, and you're obviously pressing on the anterior part of the chest wall as well. So all of that 
all of that strain, all of that movement that goes into trying to expand the lung should be actually transmitted by the diaphragm. So you should get better inflation um, for a given pressure. So the compliance should be affected as well. There's a few other benefits too. So I mentioned that you've got a large area of lung that's dorsal um, and all, all of your airways as well that will go into that lung can now start to drain once you turn the patient prone. So you, you do get um, effects on secretion clearance as well. So you might remember, particularly during COVID, when we were turning patients um, uh, prone, you get a significant amount of respiratory secretions, they can drain a bit better uh, and you can suction those. And then also that will improve your recruitment of, uh, of lung sections too. So all of a sudden in turning the patient prone, you've sort of improved your compliance, you've improved the clearance of secretions, you've improved your BQ mismatching. Um, and so hopefully you've done three or four things that will improve your ventilation of those patients. Um, and that's for not changing your ventilator settings. So you're, you're, you haven't made things more damaging from a ventilatory point of view, and you've hopefully improved things for um, sort of relatively minimal purpose. However, um, Nothing's without any risks, um, particularly in healthcare. So I've said on the left-hand side, um, the benefits that we hope to gain from uh, from positioning uh, on intensive care patients, but nothing's without harm. And as patients that are in this position with refractory hypoxic um, respiratory failure, um, so they're subject to any harm to mechanical ventilation. So if you think about answering this for an exam, those patients have only the problems with ventilation. So um, uh, weakness, you're bypassing the, um, the um, protective measures of uh, infection control to risk uh, uh, ventilator associated pneumonias and delirium um, and issues have been achieved for a long time um, but also there's specific problems associated with the care of the prone patient um, so those patients uh, you can't see their face you can't get to everything very easily so they're at risk of disconnection both of the breathing tube and of any lines that they've got attached imagine trying to nurse a uh, a prone patient with a femoral vas cath um, might be particularly difficult. You might miss a problem because you can't see patients, uh, you can't examine them as easy. There's a human factors thing as well. So, um, for example, we had a uh, critical instance at the Royal where we had two patients side by side who were on renal replacement therapy uh, and uh, a patient got misconnected to the wrong machine because of the simple change from left to right uh, in going uh, from uh, from supine to prone, that will different around. Uh, so there's all kinds of human factors and issues to think about when we do this, uh, and lines coming out. And then we're not designed to go prone very well. Uh, so you saw from the diagram earlier, we've got our patient in, uh, in in B who's sort of flat on their face, and you can imagine all the squishy bits on your face, um, your, your nose, your ears, your eyes, are particularly at risk. Uh, and so you have to think particularly particular care to try and avoid that. I mentioned about, um, uh, about trying to take the pressure off the abdomen, and that's only if you've done your prone positioning correctly and you've uh, appropriately used bolsters on the chest and, and the pelvis. But if you've got pressure on the abdomen, and I know there's, there's been some work on going at Queen's looking at that, you can get your liver function deteriorating, and that's because of uh, pressure on the liver. Um, so although there are some benefits to the prone position, um, it really, really isn't without its risks. Uh, and that's why we don't go in uh, and do that to everybody. Now, prone positioning um, would seem like a really, really new thing because we've all been dealing with a horrible viral disease over the last few years, but it was first uh, described in the 1970s, um, again, for uh, ARDS type patients. Um, uh, Gattinoni uh, did some work into 2001, which sort of established it as practice in, uh, again, in ARDS in critically ill patients. And then the PRECEIVA trial um, happened in 2013, which was some further work uh, looking at uh, looking at critically ill patients, but a, a, a subset of those from the Gattioni trial. So patients with severe ARDS, and, and it was slightly better powered. I'll talk about those in a, a, a little bit. So just to highlight my point that, um, it, that we've been dealing with a bad disease over the last few years. Um, in 2020, there was a massive spike in interest in prone ventilation searches. So this was this is from Google Trends, just to have an interest to look at um, 
uh, look at searches. It used to be called Google Zeitgeist. Uh, and everyone got really interested in April 2020 because we were trying to manage uh, these patients that had an ARDS-like picture. Um, so people got very interested and it became part of the conventional management um, of, of COVID. Uh, and then we had another interest in a subsequent peak, and you can almost map the peaks to uh, people looking at prone ventilation on intensive care. Um, so that's what people were looking at. Uh, and at the time of doing the search, um, people were more interested in penny more than holding a silver sword. It's interesting how things change. Um, so in terms of the evidence, uh, the Gassioni study in 2001 uh, was the sort of initial uh, intensive care uh, study looking at this. It was multi-center, which we like, because it covers a, a vast number of different patients in different centers with different practices. Um, it looked at patients with ALI, acute lung injury, or ARDS requiring mechanical ventilation. Um, just as locked into the ARDS de definition changes over the time, and that could be one issue with comparing studies. Um, so the intervention was that patients needed to be prone for more than six hours a day um, for 10 days. Um, and they looked at 304 patients and they found that the prone improved the oxygenation. Um, but the study wasn't power to look at mortality. So the sort of conclusion that going prone makes your numbers look better, uh, but doesn't really, the things we're interested in is, is reduced cost, reduced ventilator time, getting out of intensive care without, uh, without significant harms. And the study didn't really show that. So you can conclude that it might make your numbers look better, but it doesn't really pass the so what test. The PRECEIVER trial in 2013 um, was looking at a subset of uh, patients with severe ARDS, um, and this was early, so within 36 hours of admission. Um, they were put prone for greater than 16 hours a day, so much more than the six hours uh, for the Gatione trial. Was powerful mortality. Um, there were more patients. 466 patients, and it showed that prone positioning uh, for patients with severe ARDS for a time of greater than 16 hours did reduce mortality. So, the sort of conventional wisdom in, from the practical intensive care medicine guidance, um, the benefits probably outweigh the risks for severe ARDS, so that kind of fits with the procedure trial, where conventional ventilation fails. And those patients should be prone for at least 12 hours if we're going to do it. Um, and that's why we don't jump in and do that on all of our patients who go in with respiratory failure because they don't need it and we might harm them. We might uh, ultimately, we, we might damage their eyes, we might cause liver damage. So we don't do it unless we have a good reason to. Okay. So moving on a little bit to talk about APRV. So APRV is airway pressure release ventilation. And I mentioned on, on my other slide that the lungs full of lots of heterogeneous lung units, so bubbles that are in various states of distension, over distension, collapse. APRV is what's known as a, a, an open lung strategy. And by that I mean you're avoiding the ACLF trauma of the lung units opening and closing. So you're keeping the lung open throughout the respiratory cycle. It's a bit like applying PEEP to the lung for a prolonged period of time. And we do it in a slightly different way. Now, PEEP is really useful. If any of you have been involved in um, anaesthetics, or you've seen the setup of a ventilator, it would be incredibly rare for us not to use any PEEP at all. The problem with PEEP is that if we use too much PEEP, you can get over distension of those lung units, which I said was a problem, can lead to gas trapping and lung damage and hemodynamic instability. If we don't use, uh, if we use too little PEEP, that means that those lung units aren't really opened up enough, don't open up anymore, and we get de recruitment uh, or we get eight electron where um, those lung units are opening and closing and opening and closing. So it's a sort of Goldilocks zone of having enough PEEP, not too much, not too little. The overall goal with any of our ventilation is to achieve what we want to achieve, but preventing ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, so, as I said, airway 
pressure release ventilation is an open lung strategy where we aim to titrate the pressure so that the lung is maintained open without any of it being over distended, without any of it being collapsed. So in effect, the patient has, if we were comparing it to BiPAP, which you're probably more familiar with, it would be a bit like having a PINS, top pressure, for longer, with a very slow respiratory rate. Uh, and what, we, what we'd call inverse ratio of ventilation, or extreme inverse ratio of ventilation. So the idea is that we cycle between high and low pressure uh, very infrequently. And when we go down to a low pressure, that's called a release. And if we compare that to BiPAP, so on the screen you'll see this is taken from uh, Dr. Sampson, uh, Dr. Swindon's paper, uh, which is a really good guide uh, to look at on APRB. You'll see on the left-hand side, effectively, you've got a very, very slow respiratory rate. And you're cycling between a high pressure and a low pressure uh, relatively few times per minute. Compared to BiPAP, where you're going between a high pressure and a low pressure, that low pressure isn't zero. So on APRB, usually your low pressure, your P load is zero. But you're spending longer at the low pressure during BiPAP. In APRB, the idea is that the, the time you're at that low pressure is a very short period of time, and you, your flow never gets to zero. So those lung units never really close off. They never collapse. So you're maintaining lung units being open throughout the respiratory cycle. So you might have a, uh, a P low, a low pressure set to zero, but your T low, the time you're at the low pressure, is very, very short. So it's 0.4 of a second here. So you never actually get to zero, and you definitely don't go negative, because if you, can, if you go negative, you start to collapse your lung. So when we're setting someone on APRB, um, we usually set our top, top pressure slightly based on what the patient's been requiring before, but in this case, 25, 25 to 30. And you normally have a time that you're at the high pressure for, um, so my usual setting would be five and then 0.5 for the low, and the low pressure would be zero. And then the time you're at the low pressure is adjusted slightly uh, according to the, uh, the flow. So ideally that inflection should be uh, to about two thirds of the total distance. And then the other important principle is that the patient should be able to breathe over the top of APRB. Um, and you know, the releases are important for achieving some form of ventilation, but actually the main way that you get rid of your CO2 on APRB is if the patient breathes over the top of it. So if, you, if we've got someone on high uh, with a high CO2 on APRB, as an emergency measure, you can fiddle it a little bit to give more releases. You can reduce your, P, uh, your T high a little bit, but actually the important thing is, is probably to reduce the sedation, make sure they're not paralyzed, allow them to breathe over the top. So that's what we sometimes try and, uh, try and do. APRB will only work if the patient's recruitable, so if they've got areas of lung tissue that's collapsed that we want to, we can sort of bring into the fold and get expanded. That works. That's one consideration. That's one area where ultrasound is coming in. We can look at the lung and make a decision on that. So, a few problems. So, when we do this, we are applying a high intrathoracic pressure for a period of time, and inevitably um, that can cause problems. So, if we've got someone, for example, um, who's bottom deplete, you can have profound cardiovascular instability when we switch to that mode. So usually we want to try and volume load a patient to try and avoid that. Um, but there is likely to be some hemodynamic instability and it wouldn't be something we'd do without thinking about. Um, for patients who've got very damaged lungs, there's a risk of blowing in the thorax if we do that. So we have to be alert for, um, alert for that. But it is a good mode of ventilation um, to try and recruit patients that are recruitable. Um, it can enable you to come down on the oxygen. So one thing I haven't mentioned is that High FI2 is damaging, causes free radicals and, uh, and traumatic to the lung. And it certainly reduces ventilator cycling. So it's a good mode of ventilation um, in selected patients. Um, and so cautions for those who are body deplete um, or who are at risk of significant hemodynamic instability. Definitely not in someone who's got um, 
uh, a lung, lung leak or a, uh, a pneumothorax. Also, obviously, those are the patients would be would worry about. And um, although I'm sure during COVID, and particularly when we're returning patients, patients may have gone on to APRV when they were still feeling the effects of muscle relaxants. Um, we get the main benefit from APRV when the patient's breathing spontaneously. So um, if you do it without, uh, when a patient's paralyzed, you're probably going to run into trouble with CO2. So benefits of APRV. Um, you can recruit up all that lung that you're probably not using, so that wet sponge. The patient can breathe over the top, so it's a bit more physiological, and you can reduce your uh, sedation, um, which has other benefits in terms of delirium. Um, in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Because you're doing best, less ventilated cycling, you're probably reducing your lung injury. A few various different thoughts on um, sputum clearance. So our physios will say it's more difficult to get the uh, secretion up. There's certainly some papers that suggest that um, you, you can get increased sputum clearance with APRV. But as, a, as we came to in the previous slide, nothing's without risk. Um, it's a risk of significant hemodynamic instability. There's a risk of hypercapnia, particularly if the patient's not breathing particularly well over the top of APRV. There's certainly a risk um, bronchial fistula. You risk barrel trauma, um, sorry, typo. Um, and this concept of um, patient associated or patient induced uh, lung injury uh, when the patient's breathing over the top. So it's not without its risks. The evidence. Um, there isn't any. Uh, so there's no multi-center RCT to, um, to support APRV compared to uh, low tidal volume ventilation. Um, but equally, there's no RCT that shows low tidal volume ventilation to be superior to APRV. Uh, and actually, it's difficult to prove harm. And if we, if you end up being on high pressures through your conventional ventilation and do harm, then APRV may be a better load. So although there's no hard evidence yet, it's probably something that does need uh, some more evidence surrounding it. Um, but in my opinion, it's a good mode of ventilation for selective patients, um, provided you have the caution that you might cause significant hemodynamic instability um, and the patient with authority is not suitable. So in summary, uh, for prone ventilation, uh, Proceva is sort of the, the best classic study of that, and we use it in, as a result of Proceva um, in severe ARDS where, mechanic, where uh, conventional mechanical ventilation fails. We do it for at least 12 hours a day, uh, and there is evidence that it improves mortality, not just making the numbers look good. Uh, APRB, with limited high level evidence for it, um, it theoretically improves oxygenation, it theoretically recruits more lung. It should be less damaging to the lung because you're not cycling the ventilator so many times. Um, but there's no evidence proving one way or the other. OK. So that's. Um, that's my talk on uh, high, uh, rescue ventilation or rescue uh, mechanisms for hypoxia. Um, does anybody have any questions before I hand over to Atif? Is there um, any contraindications with APRV? Is it the same as like normal ventilation? Okay, um, so I don't know if you microphone caught that, but is there a, a contraindication to APRV or is it the same as normal ventilation? Um, so the main Concerns with APRV are that you're applying a high pressure across the uh, a high intrathoracic pressure for a prolonged period of time. Um, so the the issues with that are going to be the, the hemodynamic instability for, for someone who is uh, is very empty or at risk of gas trapping. You'd worry about that. Um, for someone who's got uh, damaged lungs or whoever, whoever has a pneumothorax, um, I. I would probably say you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do that um, in those in those patients. Um, those are the those are sort of main ones and the main problems that you, you can get with it. Thank you, Chris. Okay, uh, I'm 
just go, I'm just getting the journal club presentation up now. Yeah, no worries. I think you probably find um, different people, different consultants like APRV different amounts. So you'll probably see it variable amounts depending on who's on. I would suggest. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's uh, I think because of the lack of evidence, it's one of those areas where if it falls into your scope of practice or something you've done a lot in training or you've seen to work. Um, I'm sorry, when I was training, some people say, are you a believer or not a believer? Um, um, but I guess it's like that if there's no high level evidence. Um, so I personally use it. I've seen it work um, and I, I like it for patients that are recruitable um, yeah. with the caveat that there is the possibility of doing harm with it and the patient needs to be breathing over the, over the top to get your CO2 dreams. I completely agree. I think I see it much in the same way as other things we do on intensive care that try it if it works great if it doesn't work for that patient then stop we do that quite a lot i think some people it works really well for some people it really really doesn't so we just got to try it and see that's a good question so the question was has anyone tried to make a trial um comparing aprv and i think it probably um falls into the i suspect because it's come a lot that's a lot over the last few years. I suspect it's that there will either be stuff in, um, in work that's been designed and done at the moment, or it will fall into the brackets of uh, it's so difficult to do because of the heterogeneous intensive care population that will get what we often do with big trials in ICU, uh, and ICU, and we'll show that there's no difference. Uh, and it's all new. As um, Dr. Rutten just said, we, it's something that's worth trying. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, move on. That's part of the part, that's always the research problem in the text. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Artic. Uh, I'm an AACCS anesthetics doctor here in LRI. Uh, is someone able to just quickly tell me they can see my slide? We can. Perfect, lovely. So uh actually, thank you very much, Dr. Hepps. Um so today I'm going to talk about uh, or quickly appraise this article, non-invasive respiratory support after extubation, a systematic review and network meta-analysis published in the European Respiratory Review Series um, by a bunch of, um, I guess, uh, Italian doctors. Uh, and this was uh, published about one month ago, I think, so 2023. So, Kind of went through it along using the CASP SUK checklist to do this critical appraisal. Um, before we start, uh, just some key definitions which will kind of repeat themselves throughout, which repeated themselves throughout the article. Uh, so, firstly, when we talk about non, non invasive respiratory support, NRS, uh, they group that as high flow nasal oxygen, BiPAP, and CPAP. And BiPAP and CPAP are both grouped under their own uh, kind of abbreviation of NIV. Um, uh, when they talk about extubation failure, what we're talking about is reintubation secondary to post extubation respiratory failure in a time var interval varying from immediately after the extubation to up to 48 hours in some studies, and in some studies up to seven days after the extubation. Uh, so obviously the definition varies quite a lot from study study article to article and just uh, when we talk about risk um, patients are at high risk of developing post expiration respiratory failure what this general article um, uses to describe that is someone greater than 65 years old and suffering from or, or suffering from uh, chronic uh, cardiac or pulmonary disease so just a little bit of background for why this article uh, was made. I mean, obviously, extubation, post-extubation respiratory failure, MIV, all these are very common and relevant things to any intensive care unit. Um, but extubation failure has been described in some studies in, to occur in up to 23.5% of patients on the ITU, I mean, probably relevant to a very specific type of maybe tertiary center or subset of patients that I said you in reference to. Um, but the incidence is higher in those greater than 65 years old with chronic cardiac or pulmonary disease. 
um, which is where they kind of get that high risk rating from. Uh, for surgical patients, so those who come to ITU intubated and then are extubated here, the incidence rate is much less in general, so um, between 5 and 10 percent. Obviously, the idea of someone failing extubation and requiring reintubation can affect prognosis. So, in some studies, seem to increase mortality up to 50 percent. Uh, and regardless of that, it, can, it will lead to prolonged mechanical ventilation. There's an increased risk of ventilator acquired pneumonia, critical weakness, and delirium. Uh, additionally, obviously, there's resource utilization issues, uh, there's costs and the discomfort to the patient and, and their families as well. Um, so non-invasive respiratory support may prevent this by maintaining adequate gas exchange, breathing pattern, inspiratory effort, and assessing in the trigger bronchial secretion clearance. So I guess the first question is, so did the review address a clearly focused question? So what, what they say is, um, that the purpose of the review was to um, perform meta-analysis of randomized control trials, provide an updated assessment of the effects of post-extubation uh, non-invasive respiratory support application on the rate of extubation failure. So kind of, the, if you extrapolate that a little bit, it's talking about, so does non-invasive respiratory support prevent post-extubation uh, respiratory failure? Um, and what's the latest evidence and to support that if so so i think yes it, it answer, it's a reasonably a focused question on a very very broad topic um the primary outcome so the objective of the article was to assess the effects of post excavation respiratory failure the primary outcome that they wanted to measure was the rate of reintubation uh secondary to post excavation respiratory failure with the effect of uh, non respiratory support versus kind of generic oxygen therapy, which they talk about as a face mask or a nasal cannula or a venturi mask. Um, and then secondary outcomes are instance of ventilator acquired pneumonia, discomfort of the patient, length of stay for the IC, in the ICU and the hospital, and time to re intubation, if so. There's also some subgroup analysis where they uh, kind of separate the prophylactic and therapeutic. Uh, patients who've received non-invasive respiratory support uh, in a prophylactic way or in a therapeutic way. So prophylactic, what they mean in that instance is someone who's just been extubated and is immediately put on this type of support, um, like for instance, Optiflow or NIV, um, uh, versus therapeutic, which is where they wait un until if and when the patient develops uh, respiratory failure, and then they start the uh, non-invasive respiratory support. And naturally, you'll get a little bit different okay. results based on that. Uh, so did the authors look for the right type of papers? Were all the relevant papers included? So they reviewed, uh, so they reviewed five uh, databases, PubMed, MBA, Central, Scopus, and Web Science. Um, there was no time restriction on this. It's from the inception up until the uh, kind of beginning of their research. Um, they only included randomized control trials and they didn't limit the, uh, their research to just English written uh, research articles. It was all language articles. Um, and the inclusion criteria for that were the population had to have adult ICU patients greater than 18 years old. Uh, the intervention and control um, was based essentially non-invasive respiratory support. So non-invasive respiratory support, again, including BiPAP, CPAP, or OptiFlow versus conventional oxygen therapy, which is um, your face mask, venturi mask, or nasal cannula. Um, the outcomes that they wanted each article, each um, trial to include had to include one off reintubation uh, rates, or BAP, or discomfort, or length of stay, or mortality, or time to reintubation. And finally, only randomized control trials were included. So, so yes, I do think that the right type of papers were included to address this type of question um, on kind of this level. And I think going through all those databases meant that all the relevant papers would be included. Um, and did they do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? So, the study selection was 
fairly in-depth and laborious. They went through thousands of papers, uh, two researchers somehow. Um, they did independent screening of appropriate titles and then came together to discuss any disagreements um, with a third researcher contributing as well to send it one way or the other. They used the Cochrane's Collaboration Risk of Bias 2 tool, um, and they also used the grades, so grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation to assess the certainty of the evidence uh, related to the outcomes. So we'll just go through kind of all the results step by step. So as you can see at the top, the number of initial articles flagged up were 14,598. And it was kind of slowly whittled down um, by you know, duplicate, removing duplicate records um, and you know, any kind of where, where the article didn't meet the inclusion criteria as above, down to um, at the bottom, you'd see 32 uh, randomized control trials, which are included in uh, the quantitative analysis. Um, so in those 32, randomized control trials that included 5,063 patients. So of those 32 uh, trials, so 2,000, well, the top the 12 studies, so 1955 patients compared high flow nasal oxygen to uh, um, regular oxygen therapy. Um, Five uh, studies compared hydronasal oxygen to, so to NIV, and 15 compared NIV versus conventional oxygen therapy. Uh, in, so, in your, so the primary outcome, which is reintubation, which is kind of where, where kind of everyone's very interested in, what the graph essentially shows is that you can see there are a few, a few of those bars which hang very far to the left of the one. Um, so it shows that high flow nasal oxygen and uh, non-invasive ventilation both reduce the incidence of extubation failure compared with conventional oxygen therapy. Specifically, so the overall, so in terms of the overall effect, so what they're doing is comparing treatment, uh, they're, they're combining treatment and prophylaxis. And treatment, as we said, is when we start these oxygen therapies, once they've already started uh, their respiratory failure or and prophylaxis is immediately after the extubation, the first extubation. Um, and so what you can see is that specifically the pro uh, prophylactic use of high flow nasal oxygen and uh, non-invasive ventilation both demonstrated um, the reduced incidence of extubation um with kind of as the odds ratios are on screens so 0, 0 0.53 with the contest interval I'm going 0 0.36 0 0.77 for high flow nasal oxygen and non base ventilation uh reading 0 0.5 uh 0 point with the contest interval 0 0.35 to 0 0.72 so that's fair, fairly reasonable evidence there um, talking about secondary outcomes, so probably doesn't project that well, so I'll just read out again. Um, in terms of ventilator acquired pneumonia, your non invasive uh, respiratory support had lower rates compared with conventional oxygen therapy. Again, P less than 0 0.003 um, um, and a constant interval not crossing one. Um, patient discomfort, so the instance of discomfort was a lot higher with uh, non-invasive ventilation, which we kind of can presume intuitively, um, but that may then come into your decision making when you're deciding when to use this type of uh, treatment on what type of patient profile. Um, ICU mortality was ultimately unaffected, um, whether you used high flow nasal oxygen or an NIV or conventional oxygen therapy. The, however, there was there was evidence that um, non-invasive ventilation versus conventional oxygen therapy did <coughs> reduce uh, hospital mortality as opposed to ICU mortality, but with a composite interval 
0.47 to 0.87 uh, ratio 0.64, but the p value being 0.981. So you can't really read too much into that. Uh, the non-invasive ventilation shortened ICU length of stay um, with a mean difference of negative 0.72 um, and the p-value reading less than 0.05, uh, but time to reintubation was unaffected. So whether you uh, did did it or not, um, so whether, whether you started or not, if something needed reintubation, it, it didn't matter whether you started it later or earlier in the process, treatment treat, or prophylactically. So one thing that this, uh, so when this article wanted to do was break it down into their subgroups, so particularly prophylactic versus treatment. So as we kind of saw before, the prophylactic use of hyphenosculpture or non-base ventilation did provide um, kind of evidence demonstration that it prevented uh, reintubation. So this is again a breakdown of only the prophylactic use of high nasal oxygen or non-invasive ventilation into different types of patients. So there were the low risk patients versus the high risk patients. So as we said before, high risk is greater than 65 with chronic cardiac respiratory disease, um, but and low risk is anyone who's not that. So on this graph, the only there are two uh, groups that don't cross one. Uh, and the first one is for high flow nasal oxygen. So you're, for the post-surgical patient, there was demonstrable uh, evidence that they benefited from high flow nasal oxygen and it reduced uh, episodes of reintubation. Um, under non-invasive ventilation, it was the patients who are high risk of uh, respiratory failure who benefited a lot from uh, non-invasive ventilation prevented uh, respiratory failure. Uh, off note, so the application of high flow nasal oxygen or non base ventilation uh, as treatment as opposed to prophylaxis for post activation respiratory failure essentially showed no benefits in the overall population compared with conventional oxygen oxygenation therapy. So ultimately, are the results applicable to our practice? So you, you can argue yes. Uh, so I mean, it was a very, very large, reasonably large study, 5,000 patients worldwide uh, with all the relevant randomized controlled trials all used. It was IT specific and include patients coming uh, kind of, as a lot of these articles also include, other articles also included patients who were receiving kind of non-based ventilation in theatre or in the uh, PACU and the recovery area. Um, this was very specific to ICU um, because it included journal article uh, trials from kind of all around the world. Anything that fit the uh, inclusion criteria wasn't very specific to any specific kind of tertiary sense like a cardiothoracic unit or something like that. So you can argue then that for the kind of general uh, for the general ICU unit, they were they may find this these results applicable to them. Um, very specifically, the benefits were seen in the prophylactic use, uh, particularly NIV for high risk your high risk patients, um, and no no effect was proven demonstrable for the low risk patients. Uh, so in terms of whether all the important outcomes were considered, so failed extubation, uh, that seems like intuitively the most important outcome to consider, as well as mortality, length of stay, ventilator pneumonia and discomfort. I couldn't really think of any obviously important outcomes aside from that that would change, that would kind of swing your decision on whether you want to start uh, NIV or not. Um, and ultimately, are the benefits uh, worth the harm and cost? I mean, it's possibly difficult to quantify, but the cost of increasing length of stay, delirium, managing the delirious patient, uh, um, the 
failed extubation, the logistics, the kind of emotional baggage for the patient, family, and clinicians, and nursing staff caring for the patient. It, um, I would argue, technically, yes, it, it would uh, benefit. Um, and then just the strengths and weaknesses of this uh, meta-analysis. So it was a broad systemic search of five different databases. It was pre-planned with rigorous uh, subset analysis and investigated the impact of post excavation with multiple different subpopulations. And there was a large number of studies, uh, including more than 5,000 enrolled patients. So uh, can be reasonably uh, applicable to uh, your generic ICD unit. Um, the limitations perhaps would be that of the 32, 33 studies, 11 of them are at least 10 years old and naturally uh, medical care and quality and the care that we deliver on ICU is massively changed probably in those years, uh, as well as uh, the global pandemic in 2020, which also seems like it may well affect this kind of um it may have well affect whether uh, patients would be successful or not uh, on an IV post excavation um also one of the main kind of weaknesses of comparing this topic in general as opposed to this article in particular was that there was a large large amount of heterogeneity attributable to the different outcome definitions. So specifically, like I highlighted at the beginning, when we talk about failed extubation, that can be up to 48 hours post extubation versus up to seven days post extubation. And intuitively in my head, if someone is able to go six days post extubation without needing intubation, and then on the seventh day, something occurs that requires them to be intubated. I'm not sure if it's obvious to me of how non-invasive ventilation or optiflow on the in the first 24 hours would have prevented that situation and whether actually there's a different uh, cause causing that person to be reintubated entirely. Um, and then finally, only eight studies actually had more than 100 patients per group. So there was a huge amount of patient, uh, of those randomized control trials actually contained reasonably small numbers. So if you have lots of small number randomized control trials that may introduce its own bias, presumably given that most of these articles probably are trying to push one person in the direction of actually starting non-invasive ventilation or respiratory sports as opposed to not. Um, but yeah, that is my presentation on or my analysis of this uh, journal article. I'll just leave this table up for an, your perusal, but please, do you have any questions otherwise? I guess um, whenever you read a paper, you sort of often think about, oh, this is quite my practice, what am I going to do? So what do you do? Well, um, I felt quite sucked in by the article. I felt um, that it, it felt a reasonably good idea to start non-invasive ventilation. But again, actually, another limitation is what is non-invasive ventilation? So is that CPAP or BiPAP? And, you know, there's quite a big difference. So how, what kind of setting, how, how, is, how would that be relevant? Um, in, you know, there might be actually be a big difference between whether it's CPAP versus BiPAP, in which case that would need its own kind of further research or further kind of sub-study, sub-analysis. Um, what would I do? I, I, I think I'd still be very tempted in the high-risk patient who, you know, possibly slightly overweight, over 65, um, possibly from, you know, structure seat apnea or COPD, I think there'd be reasonably good, um, you'd have good kind of evidence and grounding and backing to start this on someone who, especially if you're 
someone who is high risk, you may be less likely, less keen to reintubate. Um, you know, there's a certainly a portion of people like that. And so therefore you want to give them a fighting chance. And if the, the numbers say that actually they do benefit, then I would think that this would give them probably the best fighting chance to kind of make their way out of ITU and a reasonably positive outcome. Great. Um, I think that's obviously the point in practice as well. Not so she's not actually smooth. Um, and we're a bit concerned about myself when I take off x ray drop flow or, or x ray to um, NIV and on the patient. Um, and I completely agree with your point about um, uh, needing reintubation after seven days because that could easily be a uh, new episode of hospital required pneumonia or something else that isn't necessarily related to the original pathology. Um, but that demonstrates really nicely some of the, the difficulties in looking at. Um, uh, uh, comparing trials in, in intensive care uh, because of the massive heterogeneity. Yeah. And what about patients who are, for example, one way of observation, who so you're aiming to get as good as possible, that they kind of plateau and get to a bit where it's as good as it's going to get? Would it be beneficial then to participate on the NIV? Potentially? Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, for some of those patients, you might be um, wanting to prioritise comfort. You might want to extubate them so that they can spend some time communicating with their family and be with them. And actually, then LIV might be more harmful. So, the, as ever, it's always the individualised patient. Um, but you might, you might want to do, do that for those sorts of patients. Any other questions? Um, I found that trial quite reassuring because that's well, the meta analysis really, because uh, that's what I do, I suppose. So I was, I had a read last night as well, and I thought, yeah, that is what we do. Yeah. Um, uh, on the high, put, it, put it on the high risk ones. Yeah. 